You're watching Saturday Story Time, 27 February 2021 edition. Hi, welcome back to Shotoku Tech. Let's get started. First up, it's Mother Earth, and the reversal of the Earth's magnetic poles may have triggered Neanderthal extinction, and it could happen again, but to us. This happened 42,000 years ago. It's called the Lashamp Excursion. The poles wandered around for 800 years before pointing back to where north is north and south is south. They've been studying tree rings at Sydney's University of New South Wales and the South Australian Museum. This flip along with the change in solar winds could have triggered dramatic climate change. They could see in the tree rings there was a pronounced increase of radiocarbon levels during the collapse of the Earth's magnetic field. This could explain many of Earth's evolutionary mysteries including the extinction of Neanderthals and the sudden widespread appearance of figurative art in caves worldwide. This would have led to dazzling phenomenon much like aurora borealis or northern lights but occurring all over the world. There was no magnetic field at all. Common cave art motif of red ochre handprints may signal it was being used as sunscreen, a technique still used today by some groups. We've spoke about this recently on Storytime. The Earth's North Magnetic Pole is moving rapidly across the Northern Hemisphere. This speed, alongside the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field by around 9% in the past 170 years, could indicate an upcoming reversal. More on the climate, meteorologists are indicating that a Pineapple Express is on the way. You might think of the Pineapple Express as a action comedy movie that came out recently, but actually it's a narrow region of atmospheric moisture that builds up in the tropical Pacific. It's called the Pineapple Express because moisture builds up in the tropical Pacific around Hawaii and it can wall up U.S. and Canada's west coast with heavy rain and snow. Researchers have recovered the oldest DNA sequence yet and it comes from million-year-old mammoths. Woolly mammoths were icons of the Ice Age starting around 700,000 years ago to just 4,000 years ago across Eurasia and North America, living in the ancient glaciers of the Northern Hemisphere. They were able to survive rapidly cooling temperatures and had cold resistant traits. But it seems that woolly mammoths inherited these traits from a mammoth species much older than that, closer to a million years old. The clues come from some incredibly old DNA extracted from a trio of molars uncovered in northeastern Siberia. The oldest is nicknamed Krestovka mammoth, dated about 1.2 million years ago. The other two molars are nicknamed Adicha and Kukocha mammoths, dated from 1 million to 800,000 years old, respectively amazing that they were able to analyze DNA from these fossils. It's quite a landmark. Previously, the oldest ancient genes that have been sequenced come from an ancient horse that lived over 560,000 years ago. So these samples double that age. So these traits of the woolly mammoth developed much earlier than woolly mammoths themselves and these other mammoths had these similar traits that allowed them to populate these colder regions and this happened much earlier during the evolution of the mammoth. Well, remind me not to sign up for a sleep study. Anyway, researchers can communicate with lucid dreamers while they sleep. You might not expect that a person in the vivid dream would be able to perceive incoming messages and provide answers to them. But this was a real-time dialogue experiment between dreamers during REM sleep. The researchers were working with individuals who purposefully set out to have a lucid dream in which the person is aware that they're dreaming. The participants were briefed on this bi-directional communication before sleep. Some practiced with sensory stimulation such as beeps or lights. 
and participants were instructed to signal researchers when they experienced a lucid dream, usually with a sequence of large eye movements to the left and to the right. REM refers to rapid eye movement phase of sleep in which lucid dreaming occurs. They found that REM sleep individuals can interact with the experimenter and engage in real-time communication, capable of comprehending questions, engaging in working memory operations, and producing answers. Most people would predict that the subject would either wake up or fail to answer at all, and certainly not comprehend a question without misconstruing it. Their goal is similar to talking to astronauts in another world, but in this case, the world is fabricated in the basis of memories stored in the brain. This was four independently conducted experiments using different approaches, achieving a similar goal. This combination of these four different labs is a convincing attestation of the reality of this phenomenon of two-way communication. Sort of reminds you of that movie Dreamscape. Japan creates a minister of loneliness to fight pandemic suicides. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga named Tetsushi Sakamoto the Minister of Loneliness. Yes, it's lonely at the top. His job to try to combat the exploding suicide rate in the pandemic. Japanese women in particular have been struggling with depression since the pandemic. Nearly 880 female suicide victims in October, a 70% increase over the year before. Sakamoto told reporters, I hope to promote activities that prevent loneliness and social isolation and protect the ties between people. Most of you are probably familiar with this piece of art named Scream from Edvard Munch. Well, it's been defaced in pencil with a message. The top left hand corner of the painting, the inscription reads, can only have been painted by a madman. The inscription was added following the completion of the painting. So curators are wondering if it's an act of vandalism or written by Munch himself. Infrared technology was used to analyze the handwriting and compare it to Munch's notes and letters, as well as details surrounding the painting's first public showing. Following the extensive research, curators confirmed that it was indeed Munch's writing. You can kind of make it out there can only have been painted by a madman. Speaking of madman, Fed sees $2.82 million worth of frosted cocaine cornflakes. I can't say they're great, but they do stay crunchy in milk. Yeah, look at that packaging. That kind of set me off there. Yeah, I wouldn't buy those cornflakes. So this was intercepted in Cincinnati large shipment of cereal that was headed to a private residence in Hong Kong from South America. Silver sparrows, red canaries, there's lots of birds in this story about malware on Max. 30,000 Max infected with new silver sparrow malware. The malware silver sparrow was discovered by researchers from Red Canary, Malware Bites, and VMware Carbon Black infected 29,000 Mac OS endpoints across 153 countries as of February 17th, including high volumes of detection in the United States, United Kingdom, France, Canada, Germany. Despite the high number of infections, there's not much detail about how the malware was distributed, and the purpose of this malware is unclear. So far, it appears that this malware is just trying to contact a server on the internet. Usually this behavior allows the malware to download some other malware later on after the infection. The large number of infected systems indicates that it is a serious threat and not just some one-off actor's test. So the Red Canary report contains indicators of the compromise such as files, files, paths, used by the malware, which can be used to detect the infected systems. Bill Gates has written a new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Gates' latest book is written from a techno-optimist -opti perspective. Everything I've learned about climate and technology makes me optimistic. If we act fast enough, we can avoid a climate catastrophe, he writes. This article actually details three different books 
and it cautions us to take some of what Bill Gates is saying with a grain of salt and look at this through a different perspective. Gates is arguably one of the good guys, but he does fly a private jet on a 66,000 square foot mansion and that's not lost on the reader or Gates. He calls himself an imperfect messenger of climate change. This last book, Under the White Sky, contains an interesting reminder about people trying to solve problems created by people trying to solve problems. By contrast, Gates is aware of the potential pitfalls of technological solutions. He still praises plastics and fertilizers as life-giving inventions. Tell that to sea turtles swallowing plastic garbage or fertilizer-driven algae blooms destroying the ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico. So, these three books together would make an interesting study. Make sure to look for the link down below in the description to my blog where you'll find the URLs to all the stories we're talking about today. Google's Artificial Intelligence Ethics Department apparently has an ethics problem. Everybody in the department has signed on a report basically damning Google's handling of artificial intelligence, and they've fired their ethical artificial intelligence lead, Meg Mitchell, who had replaced their former head of ethical artificial intelligence, Timnit Gebru. So they're trying to repair relations with the company's staff, taking some responsibility for a break in trust with the researchers. Mitchell tweeted, I'm fired. I'm in too much pain to articulate much of anything useful. Firing Timnit Gebru created a domino effect of trauma for me and the rest of the team, and I believe that we're being increasingly punished for that trauma. So Google has this disarray in its artificial intelligence division, and they keep trying to look past it. These folks have been fierce critics of Google and its management after Gebru's exit. Gebru was one of the few prominent black women in artificial intelligence research. She was fired in December after refusing to retract a research paper critical of a key Google technology. The company said she resigned. And Mitchell was co-author of the paper. Former colleagues have expressed the outrage over Google's handling of the matter. Let's catch up on some Mars Perseverance news. Ingenuity helicopter phones home from Mars. So this is the helicopter that's tucked up underneath Perseverance and it's waiting to be dropped off in the next 30 to 60 days. Well, it's successfully communicated back with Earth on its own. It sent the data through NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which acts as a communications relay between Mars and Earth and it's been orbiting Mars since 2006. So Ingenuity, once Perseverance sets it down, is going to be solely self-sufficient, relying on its own solar panel. Perseverance is going to drop it off, and if it survives a brutally cold Martian night, the team will attempt to fly it. Ingenuity is essentially a technology demonstration. It's not a critical part of Perseverance's mission on Mars. Now, I know everybody's seen it, but in case you have not seen it, Mars reveals this video that's just incredible of Perseverance landing. It gives you all of the perspectives of the landing of Perseverance on Mars. So if you have not seen it, you must see this video. It's incredible. So please, again, look for the link down below in the description to my blog. Follow the URLs to these stories. And last but not least, Perseverance rover has snapped this gorgeous panorama of the Mars landing site. 147 images were taken on February 21. These were taken by Perseverance's Mastcam Z camera system. In this panorama, the crater Jezero's distant rim is visible in the new photo, as is a cliff face of this remnant of the ancient delta. And this new panorama is zoomable, so you can inspect these features and all the others in the foreground. Please make sure to look for the link down below in the description to my blog, where you'll find the links to all the stories we just talked about. Thank you, and have a great week. Thank you for watching Shotoku Tech. Please subscribe, comment, like, and share.